Good job, thank you. I worked out perfectly.
We will rely on our pleadings to correct. The court has read your motion, and I read the defense motion to preclude. I'm going to grant the defense application to preclude the showing of the video at this point. I don't think it's relevant to the sentencing. I certainly am aware of the podcast, the nature of it, um, and I'm going to allow you to address it without further delay. Thank you, Your Honor. Very well done. Ready to proceed? Yes, sir. People. This point, Your Honor, the people move indictment 504 2021 sentence. Wish to be heard, sir. Uh, yes, uh, the people did serve notice to the court. Very loud. Uh, the people served notice to the court and to defense counsel of a victim impact statement from Irene Sacos, uh, the wife of Detective Sacos. So I'd ask Ms. Sacos to uh, please step up. and tell my babies 
that their dad, their favorite person, was gone. That broke me. I begged and pleaded with God to stop the nightmare, to stop time. In that moment, I wish I never existed at all and to hurt my children. But I had no choice. It was part of my sentence. That was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life. And I don't wish it on anyone. Telling my children and witnessing their devastation, unable to console them, is something that's been burned in my soul. I will carry it with me forever. Their hearts were broken, and I couldn't take their pain away. I could not protect them from this. While Jessica Beauvais was sobering up in a police station that morning, our world was collapsing. The tragedy of my husband's death was hard enough, but to know that it was all completely preventable is too much. Because of a single person's despicable actions, our family was sentenced to a lifetime of loss. Jessica Beaufay made choices that day that would drastically affect the lives of our family and hers also. When she got behind the wheel of that car, she did not care that she was impaired. She didn't care that her license was suspended. She drove recklessly and ended up killing my innocent husband, who was simply doing his job. She struck and killed him, leaving her windshield completely shattered. Yet instead of stopping, she chose to flee the scene, leaving my husband on the side of the road to die, and placed more lives in danger as she sped away and attempted to take off once more when the police surrounded her car. Jessica Beauvais acted recklessly and maliciously, with no regard for human life. Our family's sentence came the very day she killed my husband, and it's a life sentence. Our children have been through a lot. Their loss is immense. They were very young, barely six and three years old. They adored their dad. He was the funnest and favorite person. He was always up for any, any activity with the kids and made everything exciting for them. He was their ultimate playmate. All kids loved my husband. He truly enjoyed making children happy. When he died, our kids <coughs> became confused. They became quiet and sad. I lost my husband and felt like I was losing my children, too. They didn't quite understand the permanence of death. They were trying to figure out ways to bring him back somehow. Their disappointment each time broke my heart. Our son wanted me to get him a big kite so that he could fly it high in the sky and his daddy could grab onto it and bring him back. He cried daily because dad would never hold him in his arms again. He was only three years old. Our daughter was a daddy's girl. He was her love. Their bond was so precious and it breaks my heart that he was ripped away from her so suddenly. Her pain was deep. At night, she would pray and promise God to be very good if only he returned her daddy back. He was a great father, and they miss him every single day. I know about grief. I was 19 when my dad passed away, and it was hard not having him around. I wish he had met my husband and kids. I am so sad my children would have an even longer legacy of loss. And in many ways, I cannot begin to fathom what they have lost. Their dad has already missed our son's first day of school, birthdays, 
father-daughter dances, school performances, and graduations. Each time he misses another special occasion and makes everything blindingly real. Our beautiful life is now just a memory. We are no longer whole. It was very hard for me to come to terms with that. He was ripped away from us so violently. Images of the event haunted me. They still do. I struggled to get out of bed, and I stopped eating. I struggled to engage in normal activities with a broken heart. There was so much hurt. My husband and I loved each other very much. We were best friends. friends. We made a dynamic team. Together, we made decisions and plans for our future. Without Dasso, I am acutely aware that I am half of what was once a strong duo, and in many ways, half of myself now, too. I grieve my husband's death, but I also grieve the loss of the future we have planned and the dreams that will never materialize. I am now a solo parent. I became the protector of my family. I cannot call my husband or visit him and ask for his advice. All the decisions are mine alone, and the weight of every choice is heavy now. It's been almost three years, and I have been unable to move our lives forward. I have been consumed by this case and starving for justice for my husband and our family. I hope to get some solace after today. I know we will never get our I know we will never get over our loss, but I hope that God will help us put the pieces of our, of our lives together. As I prepare for the biggest test of my life, I will make sure our children know they are very loved by both their mom and their dad, and I will do my best to give them a beautiful life filled with love and joy, not one of hate and darkness. And I will sit solo in the audience for all their performances and graduations and clap loud enough and be proud enough, proud enough of both parents. I will carry my husband with me forever. <sighs> Lastly, I want to address Jessica Bobay's podcast. <sighs> she made a podcast hours before killing my husband for the world to hear. I heard it too. I want to say that you cannot think, speak, and spread hate out into the world and expect good things to happen to you. You cannot wish harm on people and influence others to do harm and expect good things in return. You killed my husband, an innocent man, a good man, who did nothing to you. That's on your conscience. Your choice and your behavior landed you here today. You have no one but yourself to blame. You truly earned every day you spent in prison. I hope you take that time to reflect on your actions and feel remorse for all the devastation you have caused to my family and to yours as well. Our road ends here today. Your Honor, on behalf of our family and friends, and all of those brothers and sisters in blue who place their lives on the line each and every day protecting this city, we ask that Jessica Bothe is given maximum sentence, both for killing my husband and maximum sentence for fleeing the scene and leaving him there to die. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor has presided over this case since the Supreme Court arraignment in May of 2021 through the pretrial hearings and through the trial. I'm not going to go over all the facts of this case, but I just want to highlight some of the decisions that this defendant made on April 26th. April 27, 2021. Approximately 12 hours before she kills a New York City police officer, she began drinking at her house. 
when our son was home, knowing she was going to drive our son to Long Island from Queens County. When she left her house, she chose to take an open container with her of alcohol to continue drinking that day with her son in the car. After dropping her son in Long Island, she chose to go to Brooklyn to record this podcast. And in Brooklyn, she chose to smoke marijuana, knowing that she had been drinking. And throughout that podcast, Your Honor, she chose to continue to drink, knowing that she drank earlier, knowing that she smoked marijuana, knowing that her motor vehicle was right outside, and she was going to drive home when that podcast was done. The podcast was approximately two hours. It ended at about 8.30. She did not leave that studio at 8.30. She did not leave the studio at 9.30. She stayed at that studio until 1.30 a.m. Because after that podcast, she continued to drink. She left that studio in such a condition that she could barely walk to her car. The evidence in this case showed her stumbling on video surveillance of that car. She needed the assistance of an acquaintance to get to that car. And Your Honor, when she placed the keys in the ignition of that car and put the car on and chose to drive that car in Brooklyn, everything changed. She entered this county of Queens after getting on the BQE. She was driving at estimated speeds of 60, 70, 80, nearly 90 miles per hour in a 3,000 pound vehicle without a headlight. After drinking for approximately 12 hours and smoking marijuana. And her voluntary choices left this defendant in such a state that she failed to perceive what 131 other cars perceived at 1.57 a.m., which was a roadblock set up by Detective Sacos and his partner, Detective Cassidy. And at 1.57, she struck Detective Sacos with her vehicle. The weight of her vehicle, coupled with the speed that she struck him with, was him to go airport and fly approximately 170 feet on the, and he was left on the shoulder of the highway. She took his life based on her selfish decisions. This was not a series of mistakes. This was not an accident. This was a day into an evening, into a morning, Criminal decision after criminal decision after criminal decision. And when she struck him, she chose to leave a fellow human being on the side of the road to die. Detective Sacos took an oath to serve and protect this city. And on April 27, 2021, he died in his blue NYPD uniform, face down on the side of the Long Island Expressway with his face in the dirt and in the grass on the side of that highway without his left leg. And she left him there in that condition. And as you heard from Irene Sakos, he was a father. And we often don't think about that. We forget that police officers are fathers, their husbands, their mothers, their wives. And when he left his family that evening, this defendant was drinking. This defendant was smoking marijuana as he left his family that evening to serve this city and to serve this county. While she was making those choices, he left his family to do his job, which is a dangerous enough job to patrol the roads and the highways of this county when everybody is sober. Highway officers are often on foot on these highways when cars are driving 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. And as you heard from Irene Sacos, it's never a guarantee that these officers will make it home to their families, Your Honor. He could have, she could have killed anybody that morning. She could have killed Detective Cassidy, who was the partner of Detective Sacos, who had to dive out of the way. And had she not turned the wheel at the last moment, he likely would have been hit. She could have struck Detective Wallace, who was on foot at the next exit, exit 27, processing the original crime scene standing in the middle lane as this defendant drove right by him, ignoring his attempts to flag her down. She could have killed any of the dozens and dozens of motorists that she encountered on that trip from Brooklyn to Queens County. She could have killed any of the pedestrians that she encountered on that trip 
and she simply did not care about anybody. She did not care about human life. And it's tragic that Detective Sacco suffered such a violent and traumatic death just because he was doing his job. She did everything she could to flee that crime scene. She did everything she could to conceal what she knew she just did. She drove a 3,000 pound motor vehicle with a shattered windshield and a caved in hood. She could not see through that windshield. And as the police were pursuing her for approximately three miles, she was driving at speeds of 60, 70 miles per hour through a vehicle she could not see through. After she exited the highway, she drove through a residential neighborhood, driving on the wrong side of the road, driving through stop signs, driving through a red light, driving on the side of it, before she eventually was apprehended. And when she was apprehended, she was combative when she was removed from the vehicle, screaming at the officer, what did I do? What did I do? What happened? And the next day, after she had a chance to sober up, she gave an interview to Detective Berenger. And in that interview, she minimized her drinking. In that interview, she initially claimed that she was never on the highway, that she had no idea that she was on the highway. And she claimed that she had no idea that she hit a human being. <coughs> in the defendant's pre-sentence report, from page two, the defense states that Ms. Bouvet is not just a woman who acted in an admittedly reckless manner resulting in the death of a police officer. Your Honor, I've never heard this defendant admit any guilt. I have never heard this defendant admit that she acted recklessly. In fact, the defense at trial was she may have been intoxicated, she may have killed a police officer, but she was not acting recklessly when she was driving the motor vehicle, her motor vehicle, in that manner on the highways of Queens County. To this day, she has not accepted any responsibility for her actions. And in reviewing the probation report, the defendant had an opportunity to give a statement and she refused to admit any guilt or to accept any responsibility. Moving on to page 10 of the defendant's pre-sentence report, it states she admitted to drinking a little more than she normally would, as well as smoking marijuana. She made the same mistakes that many others made. She thought she was able to function normally behind the wheel of the car, and unfortunately, she was involved in a horrible accident. As I stated, Your Honor, she could barely walk to that car and to characterize this as a series of mistakes and accidents ignores all the choices that this defendant made on April 26 and April 27 of 2021. And moving on to the defendant's trauma narrative that was also submitted in an effort to ask the court for leniency at sentencing. The defendant claims that she was the victim of trauma that she uses or used alcohol and marijuana to cope with said trauma. We don't know the source of these allegations. They provided no corroboration uh, for any of these allegations. And the fact uh, that she may have suffered trauma is not relevant to this case because if she did suffer trauma and if she did have a substance abuse problem due to that, it has nothing to do with the crime that she committed here because once she put the key in the ignition and turned that vehicle on and decided to drive that vehicle, everything changed. It was not about substance abuse at that point. It was not about trauma at that point. It was about her selfish decision to drive that vehicle that day. It was about her putting our interests above those interests of all of society in that moment. And it was briefly addressed already uh, by the people, but I just want to highlight on page 10 of that same trauma narrative, Your Honor, which states, although it was not planned or thought out, Jessica decided to focus the conversation 
not only on the Chauvin trial, but also the issues and biases that exist within the white and black community. In our podcast, she intended to explore issues of systemic racism with the hope of removing stigma and fostering conversations within the black community to facilitate change. Your Honor, the podcast was filled with hatred. It showed a lack of regard for human life. And it showed a vile hatred toward police officers, and not only police officers, but their families and their loved ones, and all of society as a whole. And based on all of that, Your Honor, I would ask that the court impose a sentence that's fair and appropriate based on the facts and evidence of this case based on the decisions that this defendant made on April 27, 2021. The jury returned a verdict rather quickly. They convicted the defendant of the top count on the indictment, which was aggravated manslaughter in the second degree, which is a sea violent felony, Your Honor. But unlike all other sea violent felonies, uh, the maximum on this count, Your Honor, is not 15 years, but rather 20 years uh, in the legislature uh, by deeming the maximum 20 years, recognize the dangerous job that police officers have and the need to protect police officers, the need to protect those who protect us, Your Honor. So we ask that this court sentence the defendant on that count to the maximum punishment allowable by law, which is 20 years incarceration and five years post-release supervision. The defendant was also convicted of vehicular manslaughter in the second degree, Your Honor. <clears throat> we would ask that the defendant be sentenced to the maximum on this count, which is two and a third to seven years, the maximum allowable by law. And by law, we ask that the defendant, this charge or this count be run concurrent to aggravated manslaughter in the second degree. And finally, Your Honor, the defendant was convicted of leaving the scene of an incident without reporting which also carries a maximum sentence of two and a third to seven years incarceration. We ask that this sentence run consecutive to the other prison terms, Your Honor. And the legislature and the courts have made it clear that fleeing the scene of a manslaughter or vehicular assault is a separate and distinct crime. Uh, and therefore, we would ask that this sentence uh, run consecutive, Your Honor, uh, to the other prison terms. Uh, I would like to thank Your Honor for a fair trial, uh, and I would ask that Your Honor impose uh, the sentence as appropriate for this defendant's conduct. Thank you. Thank you. There's no question. You're real loud. Sure, I'm usually not used to being too quiet. Um, there's, there's no question that what happened in this case was a horrible tragedy. And, and to everybody who's been here for the whole trial, to Detective Sakos' family, to Detective Cassidy, to his brothers in uniform. Nothing I say changes that or can take that pain away. I can't imagine um, what you're going through, loss, and, and having somebody rip from you um, is, is never okay. And that pain, we can only hope it heals with time. Um, and there's no question as well, and we have never denied uh, that Ms. Pouve made terrible decisions the night of April 26th and 27th um, that she has to face accountability for. Um, as you'll remember, at trial, Mr. Santos told the jury she has to be found accountable for her actions. So, and as to the pre-sentencing report, um, Mr. Lasek may not have mentioned, it was on counsel's advice that Ms. Bouvet did not make a statement, which is our legal advice, which she cannot be punished for. Um, which is why she chose not to make a statement. Um, but we say that people are more and better than the worst thing they've ever done or said. And I would like to talk about Jessica Bouvet um, that a lot of people don't know, that a lot of people haven't seen in the media or on uh, to our podcast or on the night of April 26 and 27. Um, Jessica was a devoted mother of a teenage son. She's a devoted daughter. Um, to uh, her parents who are elderly and both here throughout the entire proceedings. 
Um, she's a devoted sister to her brother and, and two sisters to Jennifer, Titi, and Ali, who have all been here throughout these proceedings. Um, I've spoken to you um, over the last two years, and Mr. Santos has spoken to her family, and without fail, and you, uh, the court can see that in the letters that were submitted um, by um, defense counsel, without fail, she was described as the glue that held the family together. She was described as somebody who made people laugh, who went out of her way to help family members when they needed it, who was the person who brought her father when he was diagnosed with cancer to his cancer treatments. Um, basically, um, she was the one who carried the load, and after, again, you know, the choices she made, but after the incident, on uh, after the, the tragic death of Detective Sakos, uh, she wasn't there to take care of her father. She wasn't there to take care of her siblings. Um, in a lot of ways, um, TT has told me that Jessica raised her as a surrogate mother for part of her life, given their age and given um, where, where they were growing up. Um, and Jonathan, her, her teenage son, she raised as a single mother, um, when, and he was born when she was very young, and now he's in high school, um, and, and now the care for him is shared between those family members um, who Jessica was once the rock for. Um, for example, her sister Titi uh, was accepted to SUNY Buffalo, is now in SUNY Old Westbury, so she can be closer to be a family member, and she's studying psychology, and uh, so she can try and, and uh, be a productive member of society and fill Jessica's role, and it's a testament um, to the parenting that Jessica did um, through her son's life, through Jonathan's life, that he's a hardworking student in high school who stayed out of trouble, who's got a job with Planned Parenthood as a 16-year-old now, even with his mother separated from him for the last three years, and obviously for some substantial amount of time afterward. Um, so Jessica is not somebody um, that spread, uh, we, we talk about the podcast a lot, she's not somebody who was a fountain of hatred or, or somebody who spread hatred. She was somebody who was a glue for her family, including cousins uh, across the country who wrote letters of support, aunts, nieces, uh, uh, people who wrote letters as far away as Haiti. Um, her pastor wrote a letter uh, to, uh, was submitted to the court about her participation. Um, you know, Your Honor saw her with a Bible and, and a cross during the court. I know sometimes we may see that as trite, as a defendant putting on a show. That's not a show. The, the, her pastor wrote a letter to Your Honor, and Ms. Bouvet's talked to me a lot about her religious faith. She's someone who was a participant in her community. And that's just within her family and community. Her family is hardworking, law-abiding, devoted people who you've seen uh, throughout this courtroom who, as Ms. Sapos said, have faced the loss of their mother, sister, daughter, um, who was such a devoted member of their uh, family. And they've dealt with seeing their, their relative, um, you know, in the press, uh, demonized for Again, the worst thing and the worst thing she's ever said and the worst thing she's ever done, and knowing that she's not, that's not who she is and that's not the entire person she is. Um, beyond that, Jessica was an essential worker during COVID. Um, as Your Honor uh, saw throughout this case, she was working in phlebotomy, she was going to people's homes during COVID and doing blood tests for people who could not leave their home. She was doing productive work helping people helping people who were sick, helping people who couldn't help themselves. When she was arrested in her car were some of the blood kits that she was using as part of that job as an essential worker during a global pandemic and you know, putting herself at risk to go into people's homes and to help people because she was a loving, dedicated person who was not the worst uh, thing she's ever done or said. Um, I'm gonna briefly talk um, about the, the trauma narrative. I'm not going to go over the details of Ms. Bouvet's private life and say that that's sort of an excuse for what happened on the 26th or 27th. But Ms. Bouvet, from the time she was 14, has been a survivor of domestic abuse, has been a survivor of a pattern of abusive relationships, and has still managed to stay out of trouble in court. Uh, has managed to uh, have a job, has managed to have an education, has managed to provide for her family, and has managed to raise a son despite the things she's done in her past. And so that is mitigating evidence because this is someone 
who has overcome things and has been a productive member of society before making a series of terrible and yes, criminal choices uh, in, in 2021, you can look at her entire history before that, and that's not the person she was. And you know, as to um, the interview with Sergeant Berenger, um, the court has seen ad nauseum uh, body camera in this case. Uh, the body camera for several hours after Ms. Bouvet was arrested shows that she's asking uh, officers over and over, is he okay? Please tell me he's okay. And she's breaking down, asking if the person she was told she hit was okay, and she only calmed down when an officer, you know, understandably, he was not okay at that point, but an officer told her he was okay, and that's the time she'd calm down. And then we've seen the interview with Sergeant Berenger when she's told she killed somebody, uh, and he was an officer, and he had a family, and we've seen her immediate reaction. That is a genuine reaction, that is remorse, and that is um, not something, we talk about excited utterances in this courthouse, that is not something you can fake. And when Sergeant Berenger said this is an unfortunate situation for everybody, Jessica's immediate reaction was, no, this is an unfortunate situation for him. He's dead, he has a family. Um, while this case has been ongoing, while incarcerated, um, we also submitted letters to the, to the court. She's been participating in every uh, re, uh, kind of program, uh, the therapy, avoiding substances, reentry, every kind of program that somebody could possibly uh, uh, join to make themselves better. She's, uh, while she's been in jail, has received offers from multiple colleges to study uh, psychology and to uh, have a productive life when uh, she leaves incarceration. She's somebody who even now says to me she wants to go help people, um, people who have been impacted by the system, people who have made mistakes um, like she has, re-enter society and avoid re-incarceration. She's somebody who even now, even after her decisions, three years, almost three years at Rikers Island, has changed people in ways we've seen for the worse and, and for the better. Ms. Coupe has done everything possible to try and make herself a better person who will be a productive member of society. Um, I have not heard a single bad word from anybody who's ever interacted with her uh, in corrections, uh, in court, She's been respectful, she's been behaved. You've never seen her have an outburst. You've never seen her um, be a difficult person or somebody who uh, was anything but respectful to the court. Um, and, you know, over other than a trial in this case, nothing has happened um, that has changed since the prosecution's offer uh, or the court's offer. And obviously a person cannot be punished for exercising their right to a trial. Um, based on counsel's advice or otherwise. Um, that's something that she has a right to. Ms. Bouvet didn't you know, testify to something that didn't happen or, or uh, abuse the court or anything like that. Um, she was, um, you know, she had a family to the court and she exercised her right. So given that, and given that, um, you know, the last thing I want to say um, before I wrap up is, we look at somebody's um, chance on, on re-entry, whether this is a, danger to, a person who is a danger to society, whether this is a person who can be reformed, rehabilitated. You look at their history, you look at the nature of the offense, and it is a tragic offense, but with all due respect, it is an accident. It was an accident. Ms. Bouvet attempted to avoid the police car, and unfortunately, tragically, terribly, and with criminal responsibility, struck and, and killed Officer Sop, Detective Sopkins. But this was not an intentional killing, as we see so many times in this courthouse. This was a terrible accident caused by drunk and intoxicated driving, which is something we also unfortunately <coughs> see every day in this court, and is a tragedy that we continue to fight. But this is somebody who, when they're released from jail, um, uh, Ms. Bouvet, Jessica will be the same person she was before the, her terrible decisions on April 26 and 27, she'll be somebody who's a working person, who's a, a devoted member of her family, who's somebody who is not a risk to reoffend or commit violent crimes or be a danger to the community. This is somebody who can reform and not spread hatred, who can learn from her mistakes, who has in jail 
continue to learn from those things and be there for her son to see him graduate college, get married, have a life. The, the, the most important person in her life is her son and obviously her parents and siblings. And, and to see them have a life um, while she can. And Jessica obviously did not mean for any of this to happen. Um, and in considering the sentence, you know, mercy is difficult, Your Honor. I understand that punishment is easy, and obviously Jessica needs to be punished. But justice also involves mercy, it involves forgiveness, it, it involves looking at an entire person. And given who Jessica was before this, given who she is, given her efforts to reform and her chance of reform, um, we ask um, that the court sentence Ms. Bouvet to less than the maximum sentence to run concurrent um, and, and um, in consideration of everything that we've submitted and everything that I've said today. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Ms. Bouvet, 
I agree with the counsel that you're not to be judged by the worst thing you've done in your life. But you are to be judged by how you react to that thing. I read every letter of support provided by the defense. I am sure that you are sympathetic and you, you, you feel bad for the Siakos family if you react to that way. But how are you going to act? How are you going to react to this? Are you going to change your, your thinking, alter your behavior, your attitude? I don't have the answers to that. You come to court with the Bible, with the rosary beads, and I contend to you now that that's the first and best place to look for those answers, and you're certainly going to have enough time to find those answers. With respect to the aggravated manslaughter in the second degree, the sentence of this court is that you be incarcerated for a determined period of 20 years, followed by five years of post release supervision. With respect to vehicular manslaughter in the second degree, the sentence of this court is that you be incarcerated for a minimum of two and a third to a maximum of seven years to run concurrent with the first count. With respect to VTL 600, the sentence of this court is that you be incarcerated for two and a third to seven. That's to run consecutively to the other two counts. The, there's a $5,000 fine with respect to that as well. Please advise the defendant of her right to appeal. Does